Welcome to episode one, the premiere of The Chris Haas Show. My name is Chris Haas. Thank you so much for tuning in. Here we are in late October 2020. November is quickly approaching and the job market looks good even though we're in the middle of a pandemic. Car dealers are hiring. I thought this would be a great opportunity to help folks out that want to go into car sales or if you're in car sales and are looking to make a move to the desk or F&I or even if you're a dealer or a GM that wants to take things to the next level, I have content that I know you'll enjoy and like all good car guys, I have some good stories for you too. Please like and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. I'm also available on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Let's jump right in and help those folks out that want to get their foot in the door. Let's help those newbies. Now, I want to help and start with folks that are looking for a job in car sales. I'm going to help you secure the interview, nail that interview, and then become a rock star on the showroom floor. So there's a lot of work that we want to do before we even consider going into a job or into a dealership to apply for a job. First thing we're going to do is take a look at the job description if there is one posted online. Next, we're going to talk about how to create the appropriate resume for a car dealership. We're going to discuss your attire, how you want to dress for that job interview. We're going to talk about your vehicle and parking once you get to the dealership. We'll talk about the meet and greet, right? Who's that first person that you're going to meet when you walk into the dealership? We'll talk about the job application itself. And then we'll talk about what you should do once you submit that application. So the job description, make sure you use that to your advantage. Take a look at that job description online and use those keywords in your resume. Next, think about who wrote this ad. The ad may have been written by a sales manager, a recruiter, an office manager. Now, each one of those folks has a different personality. We'll talk a little bit more about personality types because it's something that's very important in sales and how to identify them. However, for now, each one of those folks has a different personality and keep that in mind. You may want to align your personality with those folks. Now, where is your resume going? We live in a world where there's so much technology at our fingertips. We could jump on to LinkedIn, Facebook, and many other platforms, and most likely find out who the hiring manager is for that position. And you may even be able to reach out to them before you get to the dealership. Now, if you are having some difficulty with that, there's other ways too to go about it. It could be as simple as jumping onto the dealership's website. Most dealerships have an about us area. You can click on that and you can find out exactly who the key players in that store are. If that's not there, another option too is doing a simple Google search on the dealer. I know personally, I was having a difficult time finding some info on a dealer that I wanted to do business with. Lo and behold, I did a Google search and I came across the original owner's obituary. In that obituary was a plethora of information, including the information about who his heirs were and who was taking over his stores. So that was some gold information that I got right there with uh, just a little bit of digging. Last but not least, do you really like what you see in this job description? I like to mention this because our industry unfortunately does have a high turnover. Uh, turnover in general cost dealers north of 30% of a person's annual compensation. So don't just jump on a job in a dealership if you're not liking what you see. It costs the dealer a lot of money and it's going to be a disservice to yourself too. You know, when I'm talking about do you like what you see, it's not just in that job description either. There's sites like Indeed, Glassdoor. You can find out what other folks that have worked at that dealership have to say. Now, of course, some folks might be disgruntled when they leave a job or if they're asked to leave a job and they may put bad reviews on there. However, you can pretty easily sift through those and find the ones that have a ring of truth. On that note, dealers, just like it's important for you to have good responses and good feedback, 
on all these social media platforms about your dealership for clients. This is a very real thing. Folks are looking at this before they apply for a job for you. So if you do not have good reviews out there on sites like Indeed and Glassdoor, I'd recommend that you get with your management team and drill down and find out why not and get that corrected so you can get quality people in front of you. So the resume itself, I'm going to start and talk about your cover letter. A cover letter is very important and a critical mistake that I see a lot of folks make is that they go on and on about their personal achievements in their cover letter. That's great. I know you're proud of yourself, but that's not the place to do it. I recently came across a cover letter that was actually written in third person, kind of weird. So I would use the cover letter to talk about yourself. Sell yourself, talk about your hobbies, your interests, what gets you out of bed in the morning, and why you want to work at that respective dealership that you're going to interview for. The body and layout of your resume, you want to use nice borders and bullet points in your resume. If you'd like a copy of my resume, please feel free to hit me up. You can find me on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, DM me and I'll be happy to send you a copy of my resume so you can see what a professional resume looks like. Keep your resume at a two page maximum. Any bit more than that becomes a bit gratuitous for the reader. References, you don't necessarily have to have references submitted with your resume. However, I recommend that you do have them on hand so that if you're interviewing for that job in person and someone requests that from you, you can be that guy or girl that's prepared and can hand over that resume sheet right there. If you're going to apply for a job online, just use caution if you are submitting your resume through sites like LinkedIn or Indeed. A lot of times when you push that resume, so i.e. copy and paste that nice resume that we just talked about that you made with all the borders and the bullet points, sometimes it tends to get a bit discombobulated. So an easy fix for that, just save a nice clean copy of your resume in Word and use that when you cut and paste Personally, I had uh, folks applying for a job with me about a year and a half ago. Now, there were hundreds of applicants for one job, and I noticed a lot of those resumes came through squirrely when they were sending them through on those third-party sites. Now, when you're dealing with hundreds of applicants for one job, some of those resumes may get tend to be pushed aside, so we don't want that to happen to you. Simple fix, again, just use a clean document from Word and push that into LinkedIn or Indeed when you're gonna send your resume. Last but not least, the resume itself, you wanna make sure you have that in a nice folder, envelope, and on nice cardstock paper too. So there's a company called Southworth. You can find those materials in your local office store like Office Depot or Staples, and they'll run you about 30 bucks for a kit. If you don't have the funds for that, that's absolutely fine. You could try a dollar store and you may be able to find nice card stock and some nice folders even there for your resume as well. Also on that note, if you are going to find yourself in Staples, I'd recommend that you strike up a conversation with the folks there and let them know that you're out looking for a job. A few years back, I was in a Staples having some resumes printed and the folks offered me a very significant discount for the paper that we were just talking about and they didn't even charge me for the copies of the resume I was printing. You know, it can be as simple as that. Everybody wants to help someone that's out looking for a career, right? They see a guy or a girl that's there looking for a job, they're gonna wanna help you out. So make that your first sale. Sell yourself to the folks that work in Staples so you can get a discount on your resume printing and resume paper. So. The job description that we spoke of, you know, make sure again that you use that to your advantage when you put everything together. Please keep that in mind. So attire we're going to talk about next. Guys and girls, you know, it does not have to be expensive clothes. I know times can be a little bit tough right now, so there's options for you. Guys, you don't have to run out to Brooks Brothers and buy a $3,000 suit. If you can afford to, that's great. If not, there's other options for you too. Check out places like Nordstrom Rack. 
I know you can find some good deals there sometimes in the clearance section. And if that's not an option for you, you can check out your local Goodwill. I know from experience, my father passed away a couple of years ago. He was a fellow car guy like us. My family and I literally donated two trunk loads of clothes, many of them that were brand new with tags on them still to our local Goodwill. So there might be some finds out there for you as well. Now, on the way you want to dress, guys, I think you want to dress the way I am right now. I always think of Neil Patrick Harris from How I Met Your Mother. Great show, if you haven't seen it, by the way. But on the show, Neil Patrick Harris always talks about being suited up and how it makes you stand out. Well, it does, and it's important. You're, you'll feel better about yourself, too, if you're dressed well for that job interview. So it's something that I highly recommend. And again, it does not have to be an expensive suit. Make sure that it fits well, though. We are in 2020. Those uh, 80s Wall Street suits, they went out some time ago. Those big baggy suits, you know what I'm talking about. So for the ladies, I you know can't talk from experience. I've never dressed as a woman. However, I've seen ladies come into car dealerships and ladies that are dressed nice with an appropriate knee length skirt, have your shirt buttoned properly. You know, you just can't go wrong. Again, you don't have to run out to Ann Taylor ladies to buy clothes. You can use the same methods, methods as I mentioned for the guys. Try Nordstrom Rack, try your local Goodwill. Now, again, we spoke about the confidence level. You will feel better if you're dressed this way when you walk into the dealership. And when you're in the store, the management team is gonna to wanna to talk to you if you look like this. Vehicle and parking. You're probably wondering, why is this guy even talking about this? Well, it's something that's very important and you need to think about this as well. We work in the car business. When you pull onto that lot, Folks are gonna be looking at your vehicle. So you don't need a brand new BMW to drive on the lot with. If you have one, that's great and it might even help you out. But I'm just gonna recommend that you clean your car. Again, you'll feel better driving to the dealership too with a clean car. Make sure your car is nice and tidy. When you pull onto the lot at the dealership, please beware of your speed. Now, I mention this because you are probably excited as you're driving there. You probably have your favorite tunes cranked up and you might not realize that you fly onto the lot a little hot and heavy. You certainly don't want folks that may be your future employer seeing that you are flying through there a lot. You could be sitting with that person a half an hour after that and they might be looking at you thinking, oh, that was the person that was speeding on my lot. Not sure if I really want them working here. Last but not least, do not, and I repeat, do not park your vehicle in front of the dealership. This is a critical mistake that I see so many folks make. I watch my colleagues make this mistake all the time. I see bank reps, service contract reps, advertising reps. You pull right into the dealership lot and you park in that spot right there in the front that's designated for customer parking. It's not a good look. Go ahead and park back by parts or service in a non-designated area. Also, to those folks out there that are brand new to the business, use caution when you're parking. If you see an area where there's vehicles that have lots of stickers on them, window stickers, Monroney labels, that might be an area that's designated for inventory, so you don't wanna park there. I've seen it happen before, just be careful of it. Now, what do we do when we walk into the dealership? The first person that you usually meet when you walk into the store and those fluorescent lights hit you and that 80s soft rock is playing, right? I've been in hundreds of dealers across the United States and they all have that 80s music playing. Usually the first person you have an interaction with is the receptionist. I would recommend that you are very polite to that receptionist, shake her hand, state your purpose, let them know while you're there and offer a copy of your resume. Now, dealers and GMs, think about this. Who is that receptionist that's out there? Is that a person that you have full confidence in? Because I'm gonna call this what it is. In dealerships that I walk into, I see it all too often. I see a receptionist that is hanging back at that desk, 
She's sitting there on her cell phone, on Snapchat. There's usually a pack of Marlboros laying out on the table and a big gulp next to it. That's not a great look. And I'm not gonna get into all of this now, but if that's what clients are seeing the minute they walk into the dealership, just think about what's happening on the phone calls. So I would challenge the dealers, listen to the phone calls from the time the call comes into the store and the receptionist picks it up. Think about that. So dealers, GMs, if that receptionist is not someone you have full confidence in, you really need to rethink that. So back to the salesperson or that person that wants to become a salesperson, as you walk into the dealership, usually the receptionist is going to offer you a job application at that point. Make sure you take that application and fill out all the fields on it. There's a lot of paperwork that's involved with selling a car. So if you hand this paperwork back to someone and they see that there's a lot of areas that are left blank or it just was kind of done haphazardly, that might not send a great message about how detailed you oriented you are or lack thereof. Also, make sure when you fill out that job application, be sure that your job application and your resume agree. So simply keep an extra copy of your resume with you. Reason why I mentioned this before, I've been in the situation where I have someone hand me a job application and a resume simultaneously, and the job application says that you worked at McDonald's in 2015, uh, July of 2015, yet your resume says that you worked at Home Depot at that same time. Well, Maybe it was just an oversight on your part. However, if I'm five deals deep at the sales desk and I see something like that, I may just move on and say, hey, it looks like this person's lying. And again, it might just have been an oversight, but make sure your resume and your job application agree. So once you turn that application and resume in to the receptionist, what do you do? Now, if you followed all the things that we discussed today, there's a real good chance that that receptionist is gonna be trying to get your information to the hiring manager, right? They're probably gonna to try to get your resume and your application over to the sales desk. They'll take a look at it, and most likely you can secure an interview right then and there. So, if that's the case, I'd recommend that you hang back and wait about 15 to 20 minutes. If that time frame goes by and you see that the receptionist is not making any more moves, I'd simply approach them again and ask for a status update. If it seems like things aren't going anywhere, at that point, ask who the decision maker is and if you can have their information. Most definitely, the receptionist is going to give you that person's business card. So. In the next few hours after you depart from the dealership, I would recommend that you send a simple follow-up email to that decision maker. Let them know that you were in the dealership, that you filled out a job application and left your resume. Make sure you have that receptionist name so that you can refer to that in the email that you send them. And let them know that you're interested in speaking to them about a job there. This is also a great opportunity for you to attach your resume to that email in case you're dealing with someone that's a real uh, electronic person, they may like to have that resume opened on their desktop so they have it ready to go when they interview you. Thank you so much for joining me today. As I mentioned earlier, please like and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. I'm also available on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Snapchat. Please stay tuned for episode two, where I'm gonna show you how to crush the interview. It's eminent you're gonna get it after the things that we discussed today. Now also, please hit me up in the comments and let me know what you liked, what you didn't like about today's episode. We all learn from each other. In addition, if you'd like any of the materials that I used for today's episode, I have PowerPoints that correspond with it, please feel free to hit me up and I'd be happy to get those out to you. Chris Haas out.